This is a presentation describing important events in the development of locomotion in ancient history. There is very little evidence of locomotion in the Precambrian era. My paper appertains to locomotive trace fossils that date back 565 million years. The fossils were found in deep water environments in Newfoundland, Canada, extending our geological record 5 million years further. This would place the fossils in the Ediacaran biota. Trace fossils provide us with indirect evidence of life, giving us a better understanding of specific time periods. The Ediacaran biota consisted of soft-bodied multicellular organisms that left only trace fossils, like the ones in this paper. These particular fossils were discovered in what's known as the Avalon assemblage. The Avalon assemblage is made up of all the trace fossils found at Mistaken Point Ecological Reserve in Newfoundland, Canada. The map shown displays three boxes. Box A is a generic map of Newfoundland. Box B is of Mistaken Point Ecological Reserve. Box C pinpoints where the fossils were located on the reserve. Found in 3 mm thick green mudstone, there are over 70 of these similar traces which range from 1.5 to 17.2 cm in length and up to 13 mm in width. So the question this scientific paper is testing is, are these traces in fact locomotive trace fossils? In order to conclude that these traces are locomotive trace fossils, they first discredited any reasoning for the markings to be abiogenically produced, meaning that it was not produced by a living organism. First of all, the traces have marginal ridges which provide key evidence for movement along the surface of the sediment. Also, as you can see in the traces, there are many directional changes and no consistent orientation. This is exemplified in figures C and D as you can easily view curves in the traces. Abiogenic traces obviously do not exhibit these features because they are incapable of movement. Lastly, there is a circular impression at one end of some of the traces. While circular impressions can still be produced by a circular non-living object, it does not account for the many different orientations of the traces. Others may argue that the traces are just tubular body fossils. This cannot be due to the several reasons. The sediment displacement evident in the ridges proves that the traces are locomotive fossils rather than body fossils. Besides that, there are curves rather than straight markings. As you can see in figure A, where two markings meet, the traces are cut off as opposed to an alignment of body parts. By comparing the trace fossils in question to younger trace fossils of organisms such as echinoids and sea anemones, we develop a better understanding of what type of organism left these traces. This scientific paper focus in, focuses in mainly on the modern sea anemone, Urticina, which is shown in the picture to the right. The, they, they observe similarities in the marginal ridges, the crescent shape, and the dome-shaped structure. Mistaken Point has indeed harbored the oldest known locom locomotory evidence in our geological record, thus extending our understanding of these traces five million years further back in time. We can conclude that these traces are likely produced by an organism similar to a cnidarian, as they exude closely related locomotive traces. Here's Scott explaining how Ediacaran locomotion might have come about. As Sam has stated, locomotion appears to have developed around 550 to 565 million years ago. A team of researchers attempt to shed some light on the conditions that allow trace fossils, like the ones in Sam's presentation and the ones on the next slide, to exist. These four pictures show the trace fossils I was mentioning before. In all four of these pictures, you can see tiny little burrows, which were likely made by small worms or some other proto-animal. Given that we are looking at upturned earth, it would be very difficult for these trails to be made by some kind of non bilaterian To help gather more evidence for their claim, Gringas and Co. decided to estimate the levels of oxygen that would be present in an Ediacaran environment. Obviously, it would be rather difficult to, be, to find an environment in the modern day that is analogous to Ediacaran times. However, they were able to find something that is similar in Lost Ro Los Rogas Lagoon, a relatively anoxic body of water that still hosts, hosts microbial mats. Researchers have found that the levels of oxygen in the lagoon were considerably higher during the day than at night, hinting that these nights were likely photosynthetic. Trace fossils were from before would not be possible if there wasn't at least some kind of movement. The upturned earth in particular will be very difficult to recreate with tidal forces, currents, and other inorganic forces that affect the ocean floor. Further, 
supporting the claims of Gringus encodes the likelihood of the presence of oxygen in these environments. The presence of oxygen introduces the possibility of semi-aerobic organisms. It is generally accepted that aerobic respiration is more efficient than anaerobic respiration, possibly allowing for locomotion. Jumping ahead four million years, here is Claire with footed bivalves. In 2006, a locomotive trace fossil from Hittangian sediment in Poland was found and categorized as a new species of bivalve named Tychoplasma conica. Bivalves are a class of mollusk with a calcium carbonate shell and bilateral symmetry. They are distinct trace makers because they have a cleft foot that anchors into the sediment and creates a zigzag-like pattern. Much less, however, is known about bivalves with a wedged rather than gapped foot. Tychoplasma conica is one such trace maker. Most bivalves live in aquatic environments, but Tychoplasma conica lived in a freshwater body with varying rates of flow. Bivalves have a mechanism for counteracting these floor changes. During the high tide, bivalves burrow just deep enough in the sediment so that their siphons can still reach the surface to feed. During the low tide, they burrow deeper into the sand and tightly close their shell to conserve nutrients as the level of oxygen decreases. In order to move vertically in the sand, bivalves have a muscle group that suspends and retracts their foot to pull the body downward or anchor the foot into the ground to push the body upward. Trace fossils of this movement were found in salty cow exposure in the Holy Cross Mountains of Poland. The exposure is now a clay pit but 190 million years ago, it was occupied by meandering and reconnecting streams. Even though there is evidence of low gradient deposition in the sections where streams connected, crevices present in these layers prove that intense periods of flooding and draining occurred in Tychoplasma conica's habitat. Tychoplasma conica is a rare case of a bivalve with a wedged foot. Finding the connection between bivalve behavior and freshwater environment it lived in is key to understanding the mechanism of the wedged foot. Tychoplasma conica's fossil was found in the crevice splay of the Salty Cow Plain, where the environment 190 million years ago was consistent aside from periodic massive flooding events. How Tychoplasma conica survived these events is evident in the escape structures preserved in the exposure. The trace fossils are meniscal structures where the bivalve penetrated through a sand layer and the lowest part of their wedge foot entered the underlying mud layer with a magnitude of thrust to survive these intense moments. The bivalve was close enough to the mud layer beneath the sand to penetrate into the mud where it pushed into the sediment. Although all known taxa before Tychoplasma occur in marine environments where changing tide and oceanic movement is nearly constant in intensity. In the non-marine environment, Tychoplasma conica was exposed to high stress caused by erosion and anastrophic depositional events during random periods of time. The wedge foot present in Tychoplasma conica is seemingly related to its response to these events that are not diurnal. Flooding in the sediment prompted an upward escape response by a downward thrust of the wedged foot. Maybe the flatter surface of the foot provided a stronger base and larger surface area for the bivalve to press into the sand when a quick escape was required. Unfortunately, some unlucky bivalves were covered by a thick layer of sand too quickly and they did not attempt to escape the overlying burden. Therefore, in some of the burrows, the body impression of the bivalve is present. By looking at the meniscus structures left behind by Tychoplasma conica, scientists have concluded that when normal life conditions are interrupted by flood events, Tychoplasma conica was required to anchor the wedged base of the foot deeply into the sand for optimal vertical escape movement. And now, we will jump ahead to Angela with swimming dinosaurs. An ongoing debate regarding dinosaur locomotion is whether or not they had the ability to swim. This paper discusses evidence gathered from an early Cretaceous trackway in the Camaros Basin in La Roja, Spain. Many scientists believe that dinosaurs probably occupied ecological niches now filled by large land-dwelling mammals, which would suggest possible similarities in their behavior. However, there are not many reports of dinosaurs swimming in scientific literature, 
and they often reflect misleading evidence. Understanding locomotory capabilities is important for investigations regarding the ecology and anatomy of dinosaurs. The Camaros Basin once existed as a large lake during the early Cretaceous period and has recorded one of the highest densities of dinosaur, of dinosaur trackways in the world. This particular trackway ex exposed provides evidence on the swimming abilities of carnivorous dinosaurs. This 15 meter trackway consists of 12 itchnits up two to three scratch marks. The scratches are long and parallel, sometimes slightly S-shaped, and show evidence of sand displacement in a front to back motion. As there are no full foot imprints in the trackway, researchers have interpreted these tracks as having been formed while most of the animal's weight was supported by water. The sediment displacement and distance between the tracks are also consistent with the swimming theory and were likely created by an animal larger in size. In addition to studying the shape and size of the trackway, researchers were able to compare the imprints left with other tracks left by early Cretaceous turtles and crocodiles. In doing so, they were able to eliminate other creatures from being the track maker, which provides even stronger evidence that a swimming dinosaur didn't in fact leave the tracks. The trackway unearthed at the Camaros Basin provides scientists with a great deal of information about dinosaurs' ability to swim. Based on the find, researchers can conclude that dinosaurs were likely swimmers and used a pelvic paddling technique to propel themselves through the water. Our papers describe locomotive trace fossils in three different time periods the Precambrian, the Paleozoic, and the Cenozoic. Besides the different eras, the papers we chose covered vertebrates and invertebrates in both marine and continental environments. Locomotive trace fossils unveil secrets into the daily lives of organisms and the environments they inhabited. This provides us with information that helps us better understand what these different eras were really like.